sex with it. But you just might have a Dreamcast laying around your house. In this segment, I'm going to show you quite a bit of Dreamcast homebrew. Of course, for the segment, you need a Dreamcast. Now, this, the great thing about a Dreamcast is you don't need any kind of mod chip. All you need is a Dreamcast, a couple of blank CDs, and a Windows or Linux laptop, which is what we got here. Now, some information about the Dreamcast, which is uh, a great introduction to all homebrew. You have to understand that all of these new, new age disc-based consoles, they have a, a special way of putting the data on, onto the discs itself. Now, natively, the Dreamcast can read uh, CDRs. Now, internally, it has something called a GD-ROM or a Giga Disk ROM. It's like the equivalent of a dual-layer CDR. Now. Uh, What's really great about that is who the hell doesn't have a CD writer nowadays and CDs are pretty damn cheap. The weird thing about the Dreamcast is how it actually puts the data on the discs though. Um, the first track has to be actual CD audio, at least two seconds. After that it has its own custom file format or a way of putting the actual files on the disc. And it has to have a minimal of one, but usually two, uh, two files on the root of the disk. You have IP.bin, the IP.bin being the actual default executable of the disk itself, and first read.bin. Uh, first read.bin could be extensions or drivers and then such, and then from there you can build on what we have ELF files, but as for the Dreamcast, ELF files are usually device drivers, like if you have a keyboard or a mouse, you got the maracas, the fishing rod, you got controllers, you got VMUs, all of that could be in, uh, inside of IP.bin, but some people like to use ELF files. Now, to get started, we're going to need a couple of tools and utilities on the, on the laptop. Now, I'm going to be using uh, Windows, because everyone uses Windows nowadays, but a lot of this is command line. I'll show you a couple of ways of, of putting together a couple of disks and a couple of discrepancies of what kind of file formats and file systems the Dreamcast use. Um, how to find some really, 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 really good homebrew. Like, I started all my console stuff with the Dreamcast. Um, it was the first system I actually started getting actively involved in homebrew development, as well as the Game Boy, the Game Boy Color. Um, if you got a Dreamcast laying around, hopefully this will inspire you to, uh, you know, get the thing out of the closet, dust it off, and get it set up. Let's go to the laptop side, and I'll show you how to do some shit. Of course, we're going to need some software that runs both on the Dreamcast and on the PC. And all you really have to do is Google uh, Dreamcast Emulation or Dreamcast Homebrew. That'll bring up a whole bunch of websites. Uh, two of the primary ones that we'll be looking at today is Dreamcast-Scene.com. Uh, Dreamcast Scene is a uh, really good repository, and if you go to their database, what you can do is uh, browse through their list of software. They have all of the recommended software, uh, emulators, applications, demos, homebrew games, uh, a whole bunch of great stuff. You just got to go and look through it. Um, and you might want to browse through the hardware and get an understanding of what kind of hardware the Dreamcast has, if you care. Now, Dreamcast Scene's website is a little flaky on the download, so you might have to find an alternate download, but at least with Dreamcast Scene, you can find some good Google search terms. Dreamcast Emulation, or DCEmulation.com, is a really good repository for all things Dreamcast, uh, emulator and homebrew-wise. Now, their new website isn't completely finished or properly coded, 
So sometimes their, their download links are broken, but if you go to their help section, you can visit their original, uh, original website, which is riddled with ads and poorly coded at best. But if you look on the left-hand side, there's a whole bunch of emulators you can get for the, for the Dreamcast. Now, I'm going to be focusing on creating a self-bootable NES emulation disk based off of Nestor DC. Now, when you go in and you check out like an application or an emulator, it'll give a ranking system, usually, on whether or not something's worth the download. Now, Nestor DC is by far the best NES emulator for the Dreamcast. Um, it's got about 99% accurate emulation. Now, I originally mentioned that the, uh, that the Dreamcast requires first read and, and uh, IP.bin to boot on the root of the disk. Now, this is where plain files come in. You can download the plain files, which are just that, just plain files, either in scrambled or unscrambled mode. Nowadays, it doesn't matter which you get, because most of the tools that we'll be using will scramble it appropriately. Now, the plain files are just that. It's ip.bin and firstread.bin and whatever other drivers and folders and such that you might need. If you don't have the intelligence, which after this segment you should, to create your own bootable disks, you can get a Nero CD image or a disk juggler CD image. But to be honest, uh, wasting a 700 meg CD for a 589k emulation disk and having to do like swap, uh, disk swapping is a pain in the ass. A note about disk juggler. Disk juggler is made by Pattis Incorporated and it's really hard to find their CD burning technology. It's really hard to find their program, and I don't think it's going to work under uh, Windows NT, 2K, or XP. However, uh, Alcohol 120 will burn CDI images. Self-boot inducer was supposed to be an easy, breezy, noob-friendly way of creating your own self-bootable disks. Um, I've had bad luck with it. Stay far, far away from it. There are much better things out, which I will show you in a little bit. Now, if you look up here, there's the Jim NES Boot Nero and Jim NES Boot Disk Juggler version. It is a tool that will create a self-booting uh, Nero or Disk Juggler image. Um, it uses some some command line tools and batch file scripting, which I'll explain in a moment, to create a uh, a Dreamcast a bootable Dreamcast disk. Okay, so I've already downloaded the plain files, and I've downloaded the Jim NES Boot Nero version. Um, I've also downloaded some other stuff, which I'll explain in a little bit. So. Let me get to the, the dev folder, and I'm going to go into the Jim NES boot Nero file folder, and there's always, I've well, got some temporary stuff here, let me delete that, um, there's always a readme.txt, always read the readme, I mean, it's got a lot of really nifty information in there on what exactly to do, how to put things together, and things of the such. I'm not going to explain this, you, uh, you should have the, you know, competence of a fourth grade reading level to understand that. Um, now we're going to open up the, the Jim boot.bat file. Batch files are plain text files which can be opened up in any text editor and edited. And it's a line by line. Uh, you, uh, it, it'll, it'll execute every single one of these in a command line one at a time. So these echo commands say, okay, basic instructions. Put what files in the right places. Okay. Now I'm going to explain some of the applications which are in the progs directory. We have bin to boot, CDI to Nero, and MKISOFS or make ISO file system. Now I'm going to go ahead and explain MKISO file system. What this does is creates ISO file systems. I'll, I'll run through the options real quick. Dash R means to use Rockridge uh, disk format. Dash L means make it ISO 9660 com compliance. Dash V is the volume header, like what, what the volume ID is when you put the disk inside of a computer what it comes up as. In this case, it'll be NESDC. Dash O is your output file name, which is NESDC.ISO. And then the last right here is what is your working folder? Where are all your files located? Bin to boot will take an ISO file and create a bootable CDI uh, disk image, a Pattis disk juggler disk image of said ISO. And of course, it's using the forward slash no hack option. Now, if you have a C this is going to spit out image.cdi. Maybe you don't want a CDI. Maybe you want uh, an NRG or a Nero disk image. CDI to Nero will take uh, CDI and turn it into a Nero, uh, Nero image. So there, there it is. CDI to Nero, input file, output file. And then these commands just delete all of the temporary stuff that's, that's been created. Okay. 
that's the basics of using make ISO FS, CD Dinero, and bin to boot dot bat or sorry dot exe. You can use these files these files and modify this batch file so you can go ahead and create your own Dreamcast bootable disks. There is an easier way in which I'll explain right now. There's a program called Boot Dreams. Um, this is easy breezy. If you screw this up, you're some sort of major league retard. Once you download the application and you run it, you can select on what type of ISO you want to make. Do you want to make a disk juggler? Do you want to make Nero disk at once? Nero track at once? Burn directly to disk? Or take an image and use their internal burner, like this program, to burn an image? So if you don't have uh, Nero or you don't have Alcohol 120, you can use this application to burn ISOs. Now, remember, you need, um, you need to have, here's Nestor DC 7.1. Here are the files. You have to have ip.bin and firstread.bin on the root of the directory and the root of the on the root of the on the CD. And of course, reading the readme of the program you're using, put whatever files you want on the disk in the appropriate directories. I have my ROMs in games, I have my game genie codes in genie, I have my emulator skin in PIX, and I have the the Nestor the Nestor cheat code system in there. Whatever if this was an MP3 player like uh, DC Player. DC Player is a uh, multi multi format uh, uh, media player, really not up to par with Xbox Media Center, but for an MP3 player, it's great. I put some music in my music folder. Here's my first read.bin, my IP.bin. This is how the entire CD is going to be set up. Everything will be written to CD exactly as that. So, we have Boot Dreams, and we're going to browse, and we're going to say, okay, we're going to go to my dev folder, Dreamcast, um, Jim, well, no, no, uh, Nestor DC 7.1, files, okay. And the CD label, we want this to be Nestor DC. Disk format, there's no audio, as in CD audio. MP3 audio is not applicable. This is only data. And we want to spit this out. Okay, we'll do a Nero disk at once. Okay, we, and then we hit the process button. Are you sure you want to create a data, data, Nero disk at once image? Yes, I'm sure. Now, this is the only thing I don't like about this application. When you're, when you're, Dreamcast boots up, it's the this uh, big Sega logo comes up and says this product has been endorsed or sponsored by Sega. Um, this will actually replace that with something else. Um, do a little bit of research and you can figure out how to create your own copyright logos, which is kind of cool because not everything really is endorsed or sponsored by Sega. But either way, um, I'm, I'll just use DC emulation. And here's the Nestor DC disk at once.nrg. We're going to save this. And, and it's done. Now, the reason this took so so short of a time is because I had no ROMs inside of the um, <laughs> inside of the games folder, and that is because default ex exclaimer about ROMs being illegal, copyright material, DMCA, blah de blah de blah. I don't care. Um, the more files you put on a disk, keeping in mind you have to have a 700 megabyte limit because you can only use 700 megabyte CDs. This is the gist of how to put everything together. Now, I've already put together some. Some, some disk images, I'm going to go ahead and burn them, and we'll go to the Dreamcast side and check things out. Alright, decided to take a couple of creative liberties with the uh, with my Nestor DC. I decided to use the skins from Nestor DC 6 on Nestor DC 7. Eh, doesn't matter. Let's go to the computer side, do a couple of screen captures, and I'll show you, uh, show you the Dreamcast. There you go, Nestor DC, that NES emulator. Uh, it'll go. The uh, same goes for um, pretty much anything. The process is pretty simple. It's pretty easy, and hopefully this has sparked your interest in uh, in a uh, Dreamcast Homebrew. So, what are you waiting for? Go do some homebrew. Put some use. Put this thing to some use already.
G'day, I'm Raktor, and I'm back with segment 2 of the introduction to PHP. This time I'm just going to throw you straight into the code and try and help you along the way. We have two test files that we're going to be making today. The first one is going to be your first ever PHP file. Here's the code for it. It's pretty simple, just three lines. On line 1, you see we open up the PHP code. You need to do this every time you're going to have a block of PHP so the interpreter runs through everything between the tags on lines 1 and 3. Our main code is on line 2. All it is is an echo statement which is the way you print text in PHP. All it does is echo BSOD rules into the web browser. We'll take a look at it here. I've saved it in the htdocs directory under a separate directory called segment1. So if we open up Firefox, go to localhost slash segment1, and then open up the file first test.php, we'll see the output which is bsd rules. Now taking a closer look at this echo statement, we begin with the word echo, which is the function, and then a bracket to open it up. Then we have the quotation marks, which defines um, a string that we're supplying. We close them off, we close off the brackets, and end the line with a semicolon. The semicolon indicates that we finish that function. Now, in the second file, we're going to be looking at some variables. This is only a six line file. Uh, line one, we open up the PHP code again. On lines 2 to 4, we're setting some variables. A variable always has to begin with the dollar sign, and then you have some text. So we have variable 1, variable 2, and variable 3. Variable 1, we've set equal to 5. Now we don't need to use quotation marks, because this is actually set to the numeral 5, not the literal value of 5. So variable 1 is equal to 5, variable 2 is equal to 9. Now variable 3 we've set equal to variable 1 plus variable 2. PHP supports all of the mathematical operators, so you can do plus, minus, subtraction, well that's minus, um, multiplication, division, all of that funky stuff. And notice at the end of each of those lines we've put a semicolon. Then all we do is an echo statement and we're echoing out the value of variable 3. So, if we go to Firefox, go back up the directory, and take a look at that file, we'll see it echoes out 14, which is the sum of 5 and 9. Now, the tool I'm using is Notepad++, but all you have to do is use any standard text editor. Normally, my tool of preference is Vim, but you can use whatever takes your fancy, even just Notepad. Um, but yeah, Google some tutorials, take a look around, and have some fun with it. Okay, well, on BSOD, we believe knowledge is power, and the Internet's just a huge database of knowledge. So, we like to be able to connect to the Internet, no matter where we're at. As you see now, we're in the middle of wilderness, that's where I'm at most of the time. And uh, you're not going to find Wi-Fi out here, and if you do, then you're doing something wrong. So today we're going to show you tethering. I know we showed you last season we showed uh, tethering your cell phone to your laptop but this year we're going to show how it's done right. Now you can tether your cell phone to your laptop, to your pocket PC, uh, pretty much to any device that, that can connect to a modem via Bluetooth or I believe serial. Um, but today I'm going to show you how to connect with a Dell Axum X51V and a Motorola V195, I believe this is. It's some piece of shit, but it's got Bluetooth. And of course I use T-Mobile. Check the show notes how to do other phones and other providers. Uh, I'm not going to explain all that today. I still got to do more tests and everything, but I'll show in the show notes. So the first thing you want to do is you want to go to your pocket PC. Uh, Go to settings, then click connections, 
course, I forgot to mention I'm running Windows Mobile 2005. Most of you probably are. Anyway, uh, click the Connections tab, or icon, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Go to Add a New Modem Connection. And there, type whatever the name you want your uh, connection to be. It really doesn't matter to me. Uh, click Next. Wait for the thing to get done. Now you want to enter the number that you're going to dial to uh, to connect. So you don't want to dial a phone number because then you'll use your minutes. What we're doing is I have the $5.99 a month T-Zones data plan, and you want to access the data network, not the telephone. If you if you connect through a voice call, not only is your connection speed going to suck, like maybe four to six kps, if that, but you're going to be using your minutes and you're going to be getting charged. So, to initiate a data connection, at least for a Motorola phone, I'm not sure what the other phones, like I said, check the show notes. You want to type star 99 star 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 1 pound. That'll be listed in the show notes. Hopefully I can get Fox to go in with Premiere and put it up on the screen for you. It's behind me somewhere there. But, like I said, star 99 star 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 pound. Go through this. Click next. Um, the username and the password leave blank. You don't need it. It'll connect without it. And I'd make sure you click the little box that says save this information so you don't have to go through that step every time. Now just click finish. Now when you want to log on with the Pocket PC. Just go into uh, the settings and then to connections and go to manage existing connections. You'll see your connection up there. Mine I just named T-Mobile. It'll show the phone number and everything. Just tap and hold on that connection and then go to connect. Make sure your phone's in discover mode And it'll par. I think the first time you do it, it'll ask you to to, uh, to set a pass key. Just you know how to. If you don't know how to do Bluetooth, fuck off. Anyway, now we're online. We can uh, surf the internet, IRC, look at porn, whatever the hell you do out in the woods when nobody's around. Uh, you can do the same thing with the laptop. Uh, I can't even imagine how many other different devices, but. I'm sure we'll find many devices to cram this into. But I hope this was more helpful than the last segment. Uh, check out the show notes for more information if you have any comments. Um, if you if you got another phone that I don't mention in the show notes, please. There are different strings, different dialing strings for each phone to access the data plan. It's not a network-based thing. That's for the phone to tell the phone to go into data. Anyway, fuck off. In this segment, I'm going to show you how to piece together a 2.4 gigahertz video scanner. Now, I in no way take any kind of credit for even thinking of putting this thing together. It's just one of those, I, have, I had the right parts, I put it together, and it worked. A couple of other individuals that like to MacGyver the situation have done the same. So, I'm going to show you the basics of how to put it together. Other IPTV shows and other articles online show you how to put the system together, but they don't explain it too much, and the cost of it, way too absurd for my taste. And the way they put it together, none of the parts are reusable, so you know, you're going to go and sink a significant amount of money into a one-time use project that's probably going to lose its fun after a couple of months. Anyway, into the materials. The main key is a 2.4 gigahertz video scanner. Well, technically it's a receiver. Some units actually have an auto scan feature, which this model happen has happens to have. I would definitely look for that feature, otherwise you're going to have to build a circuit to automatically scan through the channels, which means you'll have to take the unit apart, Open up, uh, remove the selector switch, put some wires coming off the selector switch, and create a third-party schematic. Which, eh, I'll design. Maybe I'll, if you guys pester me enough, I'll design one and I'll put it on the uh, put it on the website or something. Put it in the show notes. All receivers operate on the same frequency. They're all 2.4 gigahertz receivers. It doesn't matter what brand you have. All cameras operate on the four same frequencies every single time. It doesn't matter 
what brands you get. You can get X10, you can get Lorex, you can get Radio Shack, you can get Tandy, you can get what the hell ever no-name brand. The, um, the main thing about it is your antenna type. Now this has some junk built-in antenna, but you don't even have to worry about spending extra money to get an antenna jack. Later on I'll show you how to put your own antenna jack in. This actually cost me $40 and it also came with a 2.4 gigahertz infrared wireless black and white camera. For $40, the camera alone will sell for like 80 bucks. So, I make money in this one. Um, expect to spend between $40 and $80 for a receiver. After that, you're going to need some kind of screen, any kind of screen. Not any kind of screen. You're going to need a, a screen that accepts a composite input. Now, we might, you might be familiar with my 5-inch game screen, which I've showcased on the IR Vision, um, modified to have standard AV inputs. I'm not going to explain how to basically add connectors to a screen. Leave that for the forums, IRC, and show notes. Of course, I've also got the Game Boy Advance with the video input cartridge. Uh, not the best screen, but it's portable. You can also use portable DVD players. Um, this is a 4-inch portable DVD player. I added on an extended battery pack, and it's got a video input. And so does this little, uh, little baby right here. This screen will probably run you between $40 to $60. If you can actually find the video cartridge for the Game Boy Advance, it will probably run you between 30, uh, $25 to $35. Um, DVD players, yeah, I don't know, between $80 to $300, depending on how much, you want to, how much you want to sink into it. If you're actually having problems finding screens in your area or even on the Internet, peg me on IRC or peg me on, on the forums, and I'll give you some great ways of finding compatible screens. Um, you cannot use digital screens, so you can't say, oh, but I have a used laptop panel or a flat panel. You can't use them because they're a digital signal. You need something that requires a composite signal. There's no way around that. Don't bother. Your cell phone won't work. Your used uh, flat panel for your monitor won't work. What you could do is, if you do have a laptop, go get a USB capture box, Velcro it to the top, Velcro your, this to, your, uh, to, your, to the top of your laptop as well, so when you're out war driving, you can, all, you can see your, um, your Wi-Fi signals as well as your video signals side by side, which is something else I have, to, I have to warn you about. This operates at the same exact frequency range as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, microwave ovens, and cordless phones. This is a very, very crowded frequency band, so expect signal problems without the appropriate equipment. You're also going to need the appropriate battery. Now, this device says it's supposed to be run from 9 volts. This screen says it's supposed to be run from 12 volts, but in fact, I can run them both from 7.5. I can plug this 7.5 volt, 3,300 milliamp hour battery into both my screen and my receiver, and essentially there's a portable unit right there. Um, I'm not going to get into batteries and whatnot. I actually explained some of this in the, uh, the infrared vision in the previous episode. Again, I'll put some stuff in the show notes about batteries and what to get. By the way, these are nickel metal hydroxides. I would stick with nickel metal hydroxide, they're the best for homebrew, and, and I guess beginner intermediate electronics people. Do not go with NICADs. Um, try to stay away from lithium ion, lithium ion, they get to be kind of PMS-y when it comes to heat and recharging. Okay, once you have a screen, once you have a video scanner, once you have a battery, it's just a matter of powering the screen, powering the scanner, and then hooking it all up. So, because my screen has standard uh, video connector, and so does my video receiver, all I have to do is plug this in, and there's the video signal of the camera I have right next to my rabbit's cage. Vicariously looking at long, flopped ears. Indigenous. And hairy. Yeah, I mean, that's it. Here, uh, you want to go and plug it into a, a DVD player? Go get the appropriate hookup cables. I mean, I'm automatically assuming you understand which end of a, of a, of a soldering iron to hold. I mean, you should know that button. There, there you go. Um, another thing that you can use, I don't know if I mentioned it, I do have a, a short-term memory problem, your camcorder. A lot of camcorders nowadays actually allow you to plug the, a video signal when you put it into VCR mode. You can plug the video signal into the camera and then use the camera to record. Now, a little bit about law. This is an un unlicensed frequency band, meaning anyone can transmit and anyone can receive as long as they don't go above a certain power output. But since you're receiving, no one cares. Well, they will care if you're recording um, a camera feed and publicly broadcasting it. In the United States, that is a crime. So if you want to go and use your camcorder, which I honestly think is a foolish idea because your camcorder is probably going to run at least 250 bucks. $250 for a camcorder, you got, say, $30 for the receiver, 
and then probably another 20 bucks for the battery, that's more money right there than I'm willing to break in one shot. I'd much rather go and break something a little bit less important than my camcorder. But if you're going around and you're peeking into people's bedrooms and peeking into their security cameras and their baby monitors, um, and you actually record it, to my knowledge in the United States, that's not a crime. However, playing it back is, and broadcasting it is definitely an offense. So if you go and pick up some kind of like you know frisky encounters of the third furry kind, and you record it, and you dump it to your computer, and you put it on YouTube, yeah, expect to get in a little bit of trouble about that. But if you're just walking around and, and peeking into people's security cameras, albeit it could be morally incorrect, I'm not teaching you morals here, you know, there's no Patrick's human stupidity if you don't realize that your wireless camera in your bedroom is broadcasting a signal to the entire neighborhood. That's, that's your problem that you didn't realize that. And hopefully in this segment, now you do. So, um... I've actually gone around my neighborhood and I've actually went into shop, shops and stores and I've actually showed the store owners that their camera, albeit was easy to hook up, that they don't realize that they're broadcasting the whereabouts of the shop owner and all the people in the store at all times wirelessly. They don't even turn off the camera so when they close up the shop, you can use this to peek inside and see if anyone's in there to rob the place. Once they made that aware to the people, they went and got wired cameras or paid me to wire up new cameras. So, um... A couple of times I was actually expected to get shot in the face, but, you know, you've been warned. So, receiving? Cool. What you see might not be cool, so keep it to yourself. I've actually picked up bathroom cams, hidden bedroom cameras, um, uh, parents beating their children unmercifully, um, uh, nannies not uh, tending to, to uh, infants appropriately. I don't mean molesting, just the kid was screaming his head off, probably hungry or something, and, and a nanny was just sitting there on YouTube or MySpace or something, I couldn't tell. So piece it together let me know what you say as long as it's it's legitimate G'day I'm Big Bro and I'm here at Linux Conference Australia with Andrew Tannenbaum um, Andy's the key developer of the operating system Minix Minix was developed in 1987 and ultimately influenced the development of Linux so first off tell us a little bit about yourself where are you from Originally, 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 I'm from New York City, but I'm now living in the Netherlands. Okay. So, why did you decide to come to Linux Conference Australia? Oh, well, I was invited to be the keynote speaker. Yep. Um, so, what's Minix? Minix is an operating system that's gone through three generations, and the first one, and to some extent the second one, were designed for educational use to teach people about operating systems, and among other people that taught were was Linux. But now it's designed to be a very reliable system. I've noticed, talking to many people, that what they most dislike about computers is that they crash sometimes, they don't work sometimes, they really don't care about lots of features, they just want it to work all the time like their TV set and their stereo. And so we're trying to build an operating system which is extremely stable, which can repair itself, and which is just you know, very high reliability. So originally it was created for educational use. Um, so what influenced you to create it for the educational use? Interestingly enough, there's a connection with the University of New South Wales that uh, John Lyons wrote a book about version 6 Unix, which is widely used for teaching, and that AT&T, which then owned Unix, decided to forbid the book and forbid teaching about Unix. And so a lot of people who were teaching couldn't use it anymore. So I said, Jill, I'll go out and my, write my own version of Unix, and then I can write a book about it. So I went out and wrote my own version of Unix, which is Minix 1, and wrote a book about it. It was widely used in teaching and you know, thousands of people began to use it. Within three months, we had 40,000 people in the news group, which in those days was a lot, because it wasn't Definitely. very big internet. And so, it was originally designed for teaching operating systems. So is it still in development at all? Yes, we, about two years ago, we decided to change the system from, from educational focus to one of a focus of a real system with very high reliability as the goal. In particular, we've done a number of things that can make the system be able to repair itself on the fly. There's been a lot of studies of code, and the studies show that there's about uh, various 10 to 20 or 10 to 50 bugs per thousand lines of code in all kinds of software. That means a system with 3 million lines of code is going to have thousands of bugs. In fact, people have also done studies on Linux to show that the device drivers have five times as many bugs per line of code as any other part of the system. So that with 3 million lines of code, we're probably talking about 10,000 bugs in the Linux kernel. And they're not all fatal, of course. But that just, you know, it's very hard to make a reliable system when you have 10,000 bugs in the kernel. So we're trying to build a system 
which is a much higher reliability than other systems. So what are you doing with Minix to increase the reliability of the operating system compared to, say, Linux? The main thing is we reduce the size of the kernel to about 4,000 lines of code. So we remove everything out of the kernel that doesn't need to be there. The kernel has got uh, inter-process communication, uh, process scheduling, interrupt handling, a couple of other things, but not very much else. And so we've moved all the device drivers to separate user processes, and with all the servers, the file server and the process server, to user mode. So that basically the kernel is very, very small, just handles the inter-process communication. And the, uh, the disk driver and the terminal driver and the Ethernet driver, those are all separate user processes. And each one runs as a user process, and each one has only a limited amount of power. It can only do the things it has to do. For example, to say run in user mode, they can't get at the I.O. ports. They have to make a call to the kernel to do actual I.O. And if the disk driver tries to touch I.O. ports that don't belong to the disk, you'll get an error message back. It won't be accepted. If the printer driver tries to touch the audio ports, it won't be accepted. So each driver is limited to only those things that it needs to do to get its work done. This is called the principle of least authority. It greatly limits the damage that can happen if a bug turns up. There'll still be bugs, but if a driver fails, we can detect that and replace it on the fly. And if it's in the kernel and it fails, and, and a bad pointer just wipes the system out. And here it just wipes out one process. It's much less fatal and we can um, recover from that. So it's using a microkernel. What is a microkernel and why did you choose it as opposed to the monolithic kernel that's used in Linux? Actually, it's all the way around. Linux came before Linux, okay? And Linux was later derived or you know, based on, on uh, Linux in some sense. The idea of a microkernel, which has been around since now for 30 or 40 years, is to get you know, bugs in the kernel are much more serious than bugs in user mode. Okay? Mm -hmm. A bug in LS or in Firefox will not bring down the operating system. A bug in the Linux disk driver will bring down the whole system. Mm. So you want to get as much code as you can out of the kernel, so the kernel is as small and reliable as possible. The, uh, a kernel with three or four million lines of code is just going to have thousands of errors in it. A kernel which is 4,000 lines of code might have 20 errors in it, and there's a chance you might find them in the course of time. And so the idea is for high reliability, you want to have as little code in the kernel as you can get away with, and have everything else run as separate processes in such a way as the process is a well-defined interface to the rest of the system, and in the end of a failure, that process, that component can be replaced without bringing the whole system down. So mm -hmm. it's for, for high reliability is the reason. So what license did you release Minix under? The Berkeley license, BSD license. So why are you using the BSD license as opposed to like the GPL and things that other people release their code under? Well, some people use the BSD license, some people use you know, Creative Commons license, there are, there are hundreds of licenses. The BSD license gives you the maximum freedom. Do whatever you want with it. No restrictions, except you can't sue us. Other than that, there's no restrictions, so it gives you the most freedom. Um, let's see. In the past, there's been conflicts between you and Linus. What's well, your... I, I, would, I would dispute that, but, but there was one short exchange in 1992 mm -hmm. about how to design a kernel, which lasted about a week, and that's the only dispute I've ever had with Linus. And unfortunately, that's... It's got, a lot of publicity. Out it's got a lot of publicity, but um, you know, we had an exchange of five or six email messages 15 years ago. But other than that, I've had no problem with Linus. I don't think he has any problem with me. So what's your current relationship with him? Do you talk to him much as a developer? Or? No, I mean, he's doing his thing, I'm doing my thing, but I mean, we're not at odds or anything. But when this guy Ken Brown wrote a book saying that he had stole Linux from Minix, um, and that people who use Linux were in danger of being sued by me for intellectual property you know, infringement. I came to his defense and made a website um, defending him basically, saying, no, he wrote it on his own. And so on. if you type Ken Brown to Google, you'll find uh, that whole discussion. So I defended him you know, when he was accused of uh, you know, criminal activities. So I actually yeah. nothing against him, and I don't think uh, he has anything against me. So I presume it's a little bit of people manipulating your words and stuff. I mean, there was this one exchange, you know, uh, 15 years ago, but you know, we've probably met more in common than we have in different sense. Mm. You, know? um, you also administrate the website electoralvote.com. Um, so, as some people know, you do have some strong political views. Why did you create that website? The original reason for creating the website was to register overseas voters. The, in the U.S., it's relatively easy to the register the voters in Ohio. You go to some town, you go to one main street, knock on the door, see if there are any voters there, and you go to two main street, three main street, four main street, and you've got the 614 main street, you've registered all the voters on that street. You can't do that overseas. There's uh, probably seven million Americans 
living overseas, they're very hard to find. You can't register them, but they can all vote, those over 18. Um, and so the idea was to have a website which would attract you know, voters from all over, but also overseas voters. There was a banner ad on it. If you clicked on the banner ad, it would take you, it would ask you, are you an overseas voter? And if so, it would you know, ask you what state and so on. It would ultimately lead to getting you registered to vote. That was the original goal. And in 2004, we registered over 30,000 voters, so it was quite, quite effective. Okay, so Minix can be grabbed from www.minix3.org if you want to have a bit of a play with that. Um, otherwise, thanks for your time, Andy. Thank you. Well, if you have a bunch of computers laying around the house, or you go to a client's house to fix their computer, sometimes you need a driver and you're not exactly sure what hardware is in the computer. And the computer can be buried, so a lot of times you don't want to have to pull the computer out just to rip the hardware out of the computer to see what exactly is inside the computer. So today I'm going to show you a program called IATA32. Basically what it does is it lists all the hardware, the model numbers and everything so you know what's in your computer. It makes it a lot easier for replacing parts or just downloading new drivers. So let's go over to the computer and I'll show you how it works. Okay, the first tab you're going to see is computer. Um, this is basically a general summary of everything that's covered down here. Um, the only thing real important up here that I use is I click the DMI and then go to the memory devices. Um, this is handy because when you're buying a second memory module for your computer, you want to make sure you get the same clock speed. Otherwise, the new, more expensive RAM that you get is just going to underclock itself to match the older one. So you want to make sure the clock speed in both of them matches up correctly. And like I said, the rest of this shit here is just a summary of everything covered down here. So the next tab we're going to click on would be the motherboard. Um, you can see the CPU. Click CPU ID. It'll tell you the exact model CPU you have. Um, all this fun shit here that you probably don't give a shit and down here it shows you all the different instruction sets that your CPU supports. Um, the next tab you're going to click would be the motherboard tab. This will tell you the name of your motherboard and the model. I know it's handy for me because I don't feel like opening up the computer just to see the exact model number I have so I can go online and Google the drivers for all the onboard shit that I should be using anyway. Um, next is the memory tab. It gives you a little bit of information but I find up here is better. Um, yeah, that doesn't work apparently because I'm on a laptop, so fuck you. Um, the BIOS, it gives you the information, your BIOS type, uh, the, the system date, the video BIOS date, um, all this fun jazz. Where to go, the website, get updates, yeah, who gives a shit about that. Um, here's information on your operating system. I'm not going to click on that because it'll give you my product ID number. Um, different processes that you're running on your system. It'll show you all the processes. Um, system drivers. Um, tells you which drivers are running, the state, whether they're, they're actually running or stopped. Um, all that. Um, shows you your network shit, all your shares, your logons, your users. Um, yeah, I'm not clicking on that for you to look at my network. Um, Let's see, what's in here? Um, all the information on your, your video card, which... Mine sucks! <laughs> that doesn't work, of course, because I'm on a laptop. Um, yeah, you're going to have to click on a lot of this shit, because I can't show you everything, because this computer isn't compatible with much. <laughs> um, let's see, what else important do we have in here? Um information on all your drives that are connected to your computer. Um, that can be helpful. Um, log actual logical drives, physical drives, uh, optical drives. Yeah, I think you get the point. Um, more information on your network. That's all covered in this. Um, your DirectX version. Um, devices. Let's see. This looks like it's pretty much a copy of Device Manager. Yeah. 
this shows you exactly where everything's connected in the computer and all that fun shit um, software this is everything that starts up when your computer starts um, if you have any scheduled tasks what's installed in your computer um, yeah. Windows Update, yeah, who uses Windows Update anymore? You have to have a legit copy of Windows for that. Um, power management information, and down here you can do benchmarks, test on your computer. Computers. Um, there's some other stuff that you can play with in here. Uh, it's one of these programs you're going to have to download to see for yourself. Um, very useful. I, I keep it in my bag with my laptop whenever I'm going to work on a client's computer. Uh, because clients generally have no fucking clue what's in their computer or how it works. And this will give you all the information you need. If you have any questions or comments, you can contact me on IRC. The server is irc.bsodirc.org. Thank you. Okay, by now you should know BSOD's open source IPTV. What that means is we want you, the viewers, to submit segments. And so far, not that many have. It's mainly been Fox and I that's been doing all the segments. And Fox mainly covers hardware stuff. That's what he's good at, and I'm good at mobile stuff. But we need more viewers, people more diverse in, in what they're good at doing to showcase. See, that's what BSOD is all about. BSOD is about the free exchange of information. Now, um... Like Mustang said, I'm a hardware guy. I don't do very well with coding software. You know, when I build a piece of software, I might need some soft. Uh, when I build build a piece of hardware, I might need software to run on that. And someone might not be able to build that piece of hardware, and I might not be able to build that piece of software. With our two minds combined, we can do something that neither one of us can do by ourselves. And that's what BSOD is all about. We're trying to explain our personal talents in the tech world in a way so you can get a beginning knowledge and then take it to a world or to a level that we might not even have even thought of. Also, if you're going to submit a segment, we need quality releases. That means no cell phone, no hidden cameras, you know, no if, you got a, yeah, if you got a DV cam, that's great. Screen captures are good. I mean, you don't have to have video. If you can do screen captures, that would be great. Yeah, there's, there's no point in needing like a high quality DV cam order to go and, you know, do some kind of segment on coding or showing or explaining some kind of program. We have, we have viewers and submitters from all around the world, so if you have a heavy accent, Give us, give us notes, you know. Subtitles. Uh, yeah, subtitles, subtitles, so we can put subtitles on the screen because we might not be able to understand you. Unfortunately, that's happened to a couple of people. They've uh, released some really good segments, but because of their such a thick accent, and, you know, they'd mumble a little bit, we couldn't air them because they never gave us any kind of translated show notes or anything of the such. Now, we do have rules on BSOD, and the number one rule of, rule of all rules is no blatant criminal activities. This is not a show about leak computer crimes, it's not a show about stealing stuff, it's not a show about being hardcore hacks or... This is a show about information, not illegal information. We've showcased some stuff before that, that could be illegal if used in the wrong purpose, but we, we don't want anything that's blatantly illegal. Like, you know, driving a car can be used for a crime, but most of the time it isn't. So you know, we're not we're not going to do segments on you know how to go and uh, break into your neighbor's house and steal his computer. We're not going to teach you guys how to do credit card fraud. We're not going to teach you how to break into stuff that you shouldn't be breaking into. So you're never going to see any uh, segments on cracking. If if you have any questions, you can always you can jump on IRC or our emails are on the website. There's the forums. Ask questions. I mean this is this is open source. It's a whole community. It's not just me and Fox. It's everybody that watches the show. Everybody that's in the channel. Everybody that that trolls the forums. You know, even that's if, that's BSOD. Yeah, you know, even even if you don't have what you think would be the ability to record, if you think you don't have the skills or you don't have anything to teach, you can give us ideas. You can hop on IRC, you can hop on the on the forums and say, hey, what about a segment about this? What about a segment of a segment of that? I mean, there are times that even I've requested people saying, hey, can someone do this? This isn't about us preaching to you. This isn't about saying this is how we want you to think. This is we're trying to teach you how to think. We're trying. To, we're teaching you how to learn and how to absorb information on a different level so you can do something that we can so uh, you know we have our own personal lives you know we've, we've got girlfriends believe it or not we get laid but we're not doing this to get laid don't make any kind of phallic gestures at me <laughs> but uh, 
but you know, point being is this is a show for the people by the people. Even if you can't make a segment, you can come up, this, up to us and say, hey, I didn't understand, like, we pre-release everything. That's how we keep it open source. You can say, hey, I didn't understand this term in the video, or hey, maybe you can put this into the video instead, or that into a video instead. And you can help us create the show. Right now, we're pretty much blind as bats. We're doing what we feel that you guys want to see. But this isn't about us preaching. It's about you guys getting off your asses and doing something to help the community, not just sit there and just be a fat-ass gamer computer geek staring at a fucking LCD screen with absolutely nothing better to do with your goddamn time. Get off your ass. Shit, with screen captures, you don't even have to get off your ass. You can still be on your ass and do nothing. <laughs> Ah, I get nothing else to say. Yeah, fuck it.